from the United States Capitol's Congressional Auditorium in Washington, D.C., the Government Blockchain Association presents The Future of Money, Governance, and the Law. It's exciting that you guys are all here and uh, not at the, uh, not at the impeachment. But uh, so, so welcome to the uh, State and Local Implementations and Regulations panel, AKA uh, State Fluff Stuff and Not Fluff Talk. So um, Albert, Liz, Ron, and I are gonna discuss what our states are doing um, to, leverage, uh, uh, to leverage blockchain technology or, defect, or directly affect how it can be adopted in our respective states. Do you guys wanna come on out and I'll, introdu I'll introduce you all? Come on out. We're keeping it short. We're keep, we've been told that we'll, we'll lose all of our stake if we uh, don't keep it short. So um, on the end, we have uh, um, Albert Forkner, who was appointed to the head of the Wyoming Division of Banking as the State Banking Commissioner in 2012. He's responsible for the supervision of regulation of all state chartered banks, independent trust companies, licensed non-depository financial entities operating, and the newly created blockchain crypto-friendly special purpose depository institution in Wyoming. Go Wyoming. Uh, he has over 21 years with the Wyoming Division uh, of Banking, and prior he served as the Deputy Banking Commissioner there as well, uh, which he held for four years. And uh, his experience also includes Chief Examiner of senior, and Senior Bank Examiner at the Division and a Commercial and Real Estate Loan Officer. He served as the Chairman of the Board for the Directors for the Conference of State Banking Supervisors during the 2017-2018 year. Uh, to his left is uh, um, Assemblymember Ron Kim. He represented the 40, he's represented the 40th district in the New York State uh, Assembly since 2012. His public policy solutions have gained national attention and garnered him a reputation as a key thought leader in economic development um, and policy space. Most notably, he was the first official to uh, publicly oppose the Amazon HQ2, which affected Colorado as well. And he also stimulated the larger discussion around corporate subsidies and the, en the, end and the effort to end the race to the bottom condition, uh, competition designed to lure mega corporations into various states. His latest super cool and very, uh, very timely initiative is the Inclusive Value Ledger, IVL, is a transformed, uh, transformational new way for savings and payment platform that will massively accelerate value creation and reward undervalued work, like care work, and steadily grow the health and wealth of the New York State citizens, business, and communities. Digital technology that undergrides IVL enables New York um, New Yorkers to generate, capture, and exchange value that has gone untapped for centuries. I'm, uh, let's see, did I talk, did I introduce, did I skip you, Liz? I did, you're over there, okay. In between uh, Ron and I is uh, Liz Tanner. She's an attorney and director of the Department of Business Regulation for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, she's passionate about making it easier to do business while still protecting consumers. Her blockchain story starts with a love affair for what the country of Estonia is doing to make it easier for business there. So much so much so that she became an Estonian e-resident. Congratulations. Liz will talk today about her experiences introducing cryptocurrency to the state as well as Rhode Island's first, um, first in the nation RFP welcoming blockchain to state government. Anybody here an Estonian citizen? A few? A few. I tried, but they didn't get past the KYC. Um, so I'm Russell Castanero. Uh, you start with a C, N, and O. That's good enough. Uh, I'm a Colorado governor. Uh, I'm governor's Office of Information Technology Director of Digital Transformation. Uh, my mission is championing the people, processes, and technologies that make government services a delight for the public businesses and internal agencies. It's obviously a very heavy lift. Um, I'm also responsible for My Colorado and Colorado Digital Identity, Colorado's mo mobile identity solution. Um, I have, uh, before I started with the state about six months ago, I had a company in the cryptocurrency payment space called Wampay uh, that encouraged uh, any business, regardless of, regardless of credit, race, religion, age, origin, with or without a bank, to be able to accept electronic payments. 
Um, from 20, 2003 to 2016, I ran the company that was the primary contractor for the state of Hawaii, implementing all of their uh, e-government and electronic payment solutions there. Um, um, and we won over 25 national award and international awards during that time. So let's get started. Uh, first, we'll start out with Albert, who will um, cover Wyoming's crypto bank uh, legislation as well as other initiatives. Then we'll move on to Ron, who will update us on BitLicense, how it's changing, and this new, um, this new system that he's uh, pushing forward. Liz will talk about cryptocurrency regulation and the RFP from last year. And I will finish up with Colorado's efforts on digital identity and blockchain, followed by some questions if we have time. So uh, go for it. All right. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you. Let me... Uh uh, speak with you all and share a little bit about what's going on in Wyoming. Uh, in case you hadn't heard, Wyoming's uh, been trying to make a name for itself in the uh, blockchain and crypto space over the last couple of years. And uh, since I've talked to people from all over the world in the last 18 months, I think that we've been successful in that. Uh, the, the number of issues or a number of items were passed over the last two years. Uh, there were 13 different blockchain related bills which really doesn't sound that magnificent unless you think about that was done in a total of 60 legislative days. And so uh, quite a bit of a, a, a eagerness to embrace this technology, look for opportunities for a small state like Wyoming to diversify uh, economically, uh, try to bring uh, opportunities into the state. Uh, and, and so there's a few items that uh, directly impacted our office. And as we mentioned, we uh, regulate financial services, less the securities uh, that's done out of the Secretary of State's office. But in 2018, uh, one of the, the main things that uh, occurred was they exempted uh, cryptocurrency transactions from the Money Transmitter Act. And if you're familiar with that, that's uh, often where you have to be licensed uh, if you're dealing with uh, virtual currencies. So there's an express exemption there. And then they got to thinking, well, what else can we do uh, to try to attract and make Wyoming a favorable state? Uh, so Wyoming was uh, the, the first jurisdiction in the United States to create a new asset class for digital assets, uh, predominantly for consumptive and utility-based purposes. Uh, and it mirrors that of the UK and Switzerland, in, the, in essence, the utility token. And Taking that then into 2019 and building off of some of the momentum, uh, looked at a special purpose depository institution. People were talking about, hey, we're, these companies are looking for a stable banking environment. And many of them are being de-risked or having to maintain multiple bank accounts only to get a letter in the mail saying we're closing your account effective yesterday. And, uh, and if you were in that space, you may have experienced that yourself. And so. The idea of let's find a, a non-FDIC insured institution that would just be a money warehouse, be one more partner that would be welcoming to or at least understand the complexities uh, and be able to meet the BSA, AML, KYC requirements uh, and, and allow for that, that opportunity. So they created this special purpose depository institution or as many have dubbed it the speedy bank and that the whole idea is, is to allow those to have that, that stability there. Well, along with that, uh, and there were some restrictions put on, on there. It was a, a non-lending institution, and um, it had to maintain a 100% uh, reserve position. So for every dollar in deposit, there had to be a liquid asset backing it. Again, the idea was just uh, stability, not necessarily profitability, or extreme profitability anyway. Uh, however, th th that's a pretty limiting charter. And, and the other, Thing that was coming along with it, and you really couple it with the SPDI, and it was the whole idea of offering qualified custody of digital assets. And right now, uh, that's not a permissible activity in a uh, federally insured institution in the U.S. So that's what makes the SPDI kind of sets it apart, and that would be the first of its kind in this country that would uh, uh, be open to that, not be restricted uh, under some of the federal prohibitions of that. And so we spent uh, the, the last year working on uh, regulations around the framework. Uh, how can you do this? And came up with probably, uh, built a team of stakeholders from technologists and, and coders and developers to bank and securities attorneys, uh, some uh, institutions that were currently in existence that are looking at, at crypto asset holdings, uh, regulators, 
and uh, um, and our office and came up with uh, pretty comprehensive regulations around this. And probably right now uh, one of the most comprehensive and, and provides the most clarity in the United States. And and so that was in effect. And now we have uh, after hundreds, literally hundreds of calls from from folks all over the world looking at this. We've got a handful of entities, and some of them uh, would be names that are recognized by probably everyone in this room that are global players that plan on. Uh, uh, utilizing and applying for our special purpose depository institution. And the, the last thing I would say about that and then the attractiveness is to be a bank, uh, there's certain uh, uncertainties whether uh, and how a trust company structure fits in with the SEC and the uh, CFTC's guidance that was, uh, or sometimes lack of guidance. And, and, and so that's what looking at the, the bank charter and how our SPDI meets the definition of bank uh, under multiple state and federal laws, which by the way in the US we had no idea that bank was defined so many different ways. It, it's amazing. Uh, and so uh, I think we'll, we'll see that uh, over the coming year, um, like I said, how many people actually do apply. We've got some pretty stringent requirements, uh, but I think that those that are active in this space or in their license in other jurisdictions around the world are looking for that certainty in the U.S. and, and I think we may have uh, found uh, at least a, a, another lay of certainty for them. So uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll maybe at the end uh, take any questions or, or I'd love to talk to folks out in the hall after our session. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> All right. Um, how many people here have heard of the New York bit license? Almost everyone, okay. So my mission right now is to take one of the least friendliest space, spaces around the world or toward decentralized technology to the friendliest and the most open and engaged uh, space uh, in New York. Uh, the bit license was cl uh, was created under uh, the former superintendent of our version of the bank's uh, commission, the DFS, Department of Financial Services, and he it was a unilaterally done reg, and it's not the law, it's not the statute, and immediately after he passed the regulations, he left public service to sit on a board of one of the biggest crypto exchanges where he helped usher in that company to get a bill license uh, in New York State. Um, the problem with these regs is it's very confusing. Uh, it's horrible for startup companies. The way it's written, it's almost impossible for startup companies to qualify. The, the liability insurance, the, the bonds you have to undertake, it's really written for only the biggest players to come in and qualify. Uh, it's not very welcoming. And if you're a miner, if you're doing other components of, of the space, you, you have no, there's no clarity on whether you need to get a license or not. Um, my goal uh, immediately, and mirroring after what Wyoming and Utah has been doing, I introduced um, a sandbox legislation to you know, reciprocate some of the efforts that's going on in places like Utah and, and Wyoming and go further. So the, the bill that I introduced, uh, the Inclusive Value Ledger, IVL, uh, my ultimate vision is to put benefits and public benefits on the blockchain. Um, I believe the benefit systems, the private uh, benefits that we uh, deploy to our citizens all around, all around the country are very rigid and are very uh, bureaucratic and we often do not get to the end result, which is serving some of the most vulnerable populations in our communities. For example, um, six years ago when I was first elected, I had a 67-year-old man, uh, his name was Mr. Deng, he's a Chinese immigrant. He had cataracts and he could barely walk. He was personally blind. He had no family and he walked into my office because he needed some help with applying for health benefits and other social benefits. The problem with him was that he was living in an illegally converted apartment with six other seniors in a one bedroom shack in downtown Queens. Um, so the, the, the landlord couldn't provide a proof of residence. So to the government and to the bureaucratic system, he did not exist. Um, and 
but the mayor's office and everyone else, they're well-intended. They want to somehow serve him, but they're, the layers of uh, the variance we have to get to get the type of benefits that he desperately needed could not be reached. By making our benefit system more portable and more fluid, we could not, we could not only just make sure that people are receiving the right benefits, but we could actually use those benefits to create almost a voucher, alternative, complementary currency system. Imagine um, having a public payment architecture where you can have access to benefits, whether it be individual tax credits or social benefits, months in advance, and you can start trading and transferring and treat it like real cash. In places like New York, they would input up to $56 billion toward local commerce and often on, and to also capture unvalued work, such as in, in the care economy. Um, this is something that, um, that I'm trying to push forward. We have supporters that are willing to work with us uh, if, it's, if it can't be done legislatively, just to kind of fund uh, a proof of concept at smaller cities around the country. Uh, if you're interested, um, check it out at www.inclusive.money, and I'd love to talk to, more, talk to you more about it uh, today or, or afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, how many people here are from government? Raise your hands. Okay. So I'll start by first kind of telling the story of how the state of Rhode Island got into this. Uh, it started with, uh, um, I was hired to make it easier to do business within the state of Rhode Island as, a, as an attorney. I'd opened up hundreds of businesses and they said, make it easier. So I started looking at what other states in the country uh, did, and there really wasn't a lot, to be perfectly honest. And so I started looking internationally, and that's how I found Estonia and became an e-resident and, and have kind of used that as a model to say, okay, you know, this is, the, this is what can be done. You know, we have a long way to go, but this is what can be done. So when I, uh, that's when Estonia started talking about the fact that part of what they do is based on blockchain, and I had never heard of it before. So coincidentally, uh, a month or two later, uh, the blockchain summit with a bunch of crypto folks came to Rhode Island, and because I was probably the only person who had uttered the word blockchain, the governor said, you're the expert. So, uh, so I became the, the, the blockchain expert you know, after uh, very minimal research. So guess what? I did a lot of research, and I, I learned a lot about blockchain very quickly. Uh, and... It was a, an interesting transformation to see how it comes. But um, after the summit, we started talking to people to say, okay, what do you have to do, right? And so if you're a government who hasn't done anything, I'll tell you what we did was we, we talked about 100 people over about a six month period. We talked to lawyers, uh, both nationally and internationally. We talked to governments, both uh, state governments and international governments. And we, once we um, got sort of the gist of what we felt was the right direction. We also did things locally as well because we said, all right, what are we missing from a, a local perspective? So that was super important to have. And I'll tell you what we learned. We heard the same thing over and over and over again. The one thing they wanted the most was clarity of laws because they don't know what the rules are. They don't know what the regulations are. What can they, can they do or not do? We also learned that they want some sort of an incubator. They want to work together. They wanted to, um, they want to be educated. They want to train. They want to uh, bounce things off of each other. They want workforce training. They want there to be more blockchain coders out there. And they also want an opportunity to use their product. So once we sort of heard all that, we said, all right, what, you know, what can the state of Rhode Island do? So we did a ton of research and found out that uh, our, uh, there's only about a dozen states that still have money transmitter laws that would need to change for crypto, and Rhode Island was not one of them. So to our surprise, we didn't have to change uh, anything to allow for blockchain. Uh, we did find, after comparing ourselves to New York, uh, that we were, uh, New York and, and Rhode Island were the only states that required two licenses to exchange crypto. So we did create a new virtual currency license, and that was probably the hardest thing that we did was trying to define virtual currency. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking to other states and governments saying, you know, how are you defining this? Is this the right language as of today? Because it seems like it changes uh, very quickly. We also found out that we already have a regulatory sandbox. So we had a bill ready to go only to find out that we didn't need one. So Rhode Island already has a regulatory sandbox. We had to change our license. That was it. Um, but we do allow for crypto. So what do I recommend for other governments who are looking at it is to just talk to as many people as you can, um, realize that you might not need that many legislative uh, changes, and definitely to talk to your in-state experts, because uh, we are continually surprised uh, how many in-state experts we have in this space who are more than willing to be a part of the process to help you answer your questions. Another thing that we did was um, to put out the RFP. So our RFP, we believe, is the uh, first in the nation where we requested uh, vendors to prov provide ideas to us 
on ways to make government more efficient. And we listed a, a bunch of potential use cases for us. And within a very short amount of time, we received over uh, 30 plus, excuse me, 30 plus uh, vendors with over 60 ideas. So you can imagine it took a long time for us to go through all of those. Some of the ideas that we received applications on were marijuana, public finance, which was uh, crowdfunding, currency, bonds, some voting, notarization, credentialing, homelessness, vehicle titling, land evidence. I mean, that's a wide variety of things across government. You know, just getting the right people in the room to hear the proposal was, uh, was one of the big uh, hindrances. Plus, everything came to us in August, and state government workers love to take time off in, um, in August. We narrowed it down to seven vendors and 12 ideas. And um, while the plan was for me to be able to announce today who they were, you know how state government is, and so uh, it's still coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, but I can tell you what I am most interested in and what I would like to pursue is a version of digital identity. I think that it's easier to focus on a business identity than a personal identity. It seems like personal identity is still a little scary to handle. Um, but in, in the ideal world, if, if, a, if Liz Tanner owns ABC Company and I can have my identity checked and then I can work with the Secretary of State's office, work with taxation and get whatever licenses and permits I need, uh, that, you know, that's, that's the way that I would like to go and, and really excited to see if that's a possibility. So thank you. I think that was the Chief Justice gavel that was going off earlier. Um, so um, around uh, 2013, I was, uh, I was in Hawaii and working with the Department of Health, and they were um, having us set up the new regulatory system for uh, cannabis, uh, medical cannabis licensing. And there was a $50,000 licensing fee just to apply. And I realized that um, we did, there was no way we could take that payment electronically because none of them could have banks in Hawaii. So I, uh, I actually went to South by Southwest that year to learn everything I could about Bitcoin because there was only place you could do it at the time, and uh, learned all about it and worked hard. But that was my introduction into, into blockchain and, and government. Um, fast forward, I had started um, in 2018, uh, Wampay, which is a, a crypto, here he goes again, a crypto uh, payments platform. And um, I, I, want, I needed to move from Hawaii because traveling back and forth was insane. And it turns out that Colorado had uh, Governor Hickenlooper, a super pro-blockchain, pro-Bitcoin, pro-cryptocurrency pro governor. Uh, now, the new governor, Governor Jared Polis, is even more so. He's doubled down. In fact, um, last year, uh, there was a... a there was a crypto, it was a, uh, a blockchain day at the Capitol, and the governor officially proclaimed that Colorado was in blockchain for the win. So watch out, Wyoming, <laughs> and Rhode Island, and New York, and Illinois, and the, the list goes on and on, and Utah County. Um, and, uh, and so um, this was really exciting. There were over 30 companies um, that had a presence in Colorado that were there. Um, so moving forward, we've passed legislation last session on the Digital Token Act, legitimizing um, tokens and use tokens for, um, for investment purposes, um, normalizing exactly how we regulate those things. Uh, we, didn't, we, we actually made a sandbox as well. Um, you guys didn't need to, but we, we did need to, so we have that. And, uh, and when now we're working on, on further, we had a governor's executive order last year that coincided with um, something I'll talk about in a minute that, um, that also um, legitimized a, a digital identity product that we came out with called My Colorado. Um, but first, what's really cool is in March of this year, so just in a few weeks, uh, we'll be running what's called a Bountathon. And uh, this is sort of a month-long hackathon-like contest. We identified eight um, use cases within government that um, needed to be solved, and uh, and blockchain was a good a good, good uh, a good solution option for. Uh, the funding was provided by the legislature last year, and um, we will be we've got subject matter experts from the different agencies that have those particular problems, and we're going to be judging those. Uh, we're working with them over the course of that month, judging them, and at the end of it, they'll get a cash award if they're um, open source. And whether they're cash award or not, whether they're open source or not, they may be followed by a procurement event. So we're um, we're really putting forth, uh, you know, putting our money where our mouth is on this. 
and walking the walk. Um, as I said, I, I started um, with, with the state last July. I think, I think I mentioned that. And there's all these great use cases. Many have been mentioned up here and in other panels, payments, voting, document recording, consent, KYC, AML, public registries, legislative tracking, credentialing, the list goes on and on. But um, one thing that really stops all of these from getting traction is uh, what Liz already mentioned today, which is identity. Right? Identity is what is limiting us. And if you think about sort of the information superhighway that's out there, this great electronic thing, digital thing that we've got, the on-ramps are all analog. And digital identity gives people a fast track way to start using things without having to get hung up on, um, on dealing with things like KYC, know your customer um, um, processes all depend on paper processes. Somebody is a paper-based trust anchor for all of that. So we can't get traction with this technology really until we have easily validatable, um, usable digital identity. Um, and so that's where My Colorado comes in. My Colorado is an app. Um, and it's the Colorado Digital Identity Solution. We launched it in, uh, on October 31st of last year. And already, as of I think last week, had 36,000 um, users who had downloaded the app. Um, any, uh, st any state DMV, any, Col any Colorado DMV issued state ID or driver's license can log in, do all the validation for it. We leveraged a few different partners for that and actually see and get their digital ID. Um, any of you are interested, I can show you. I'm very proud of it. It's exciting. Um, it has things like, a, like an idea of a, a vanity ID, which you can filter which attributes you want to share. So if you go up to a bar, all they really need to know is that it's you and you're over 21. So you can hide all the attributes except for the fact that your picture's on there, it looks like your license, and it says that you're over 21. Um, right now, it's all visual. And, uh, and that's because that's the only way people have to use it. The next version is going to be sharing that information electronically to where you as a, a license holder can choose to put your information to, um, to a merchant, to an agency, to a law enforcement officer um, electronically and securely uh, without having, you know, so it eliminates a lot of the opportunity for fraud. Um, you have fake IDs, you can have fake I applications, all of that, and uh, secures the whole thing. And the gold standard for all this is going to be when you can go to the TSA and have a completely electronic check-in without having to hand them your driver's license, right? And that's the, the goal at the end of the day. And we're working with organizations like AMVA on their mobile driver's license um, standards for that. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the idea that you can also do real-time KYC. Many of you are in financial in industries. You know that uh, banks typically pay between $45 and $85 just to do know your customer, any money laundering compliance for each new customer they have. Uh, normally, it's not a real-time process. We're looking at, with digital ID, making it so that that's actually able to be a real-time process. That, um, you know, having electronic notaries that, that don't just drive around, that actually work with you completely electronically, being able to vote and poll because we know who you are and you have a, basically a, a signature process that you can use. All of this um, will leverage blockchain technology, right? Just looking at an ID doesn't need it, but the next stage when you need to confirm. So who here has been to a dispensary? It's, some of you may not be able to say, so I understand that. I oversee marijuana. Yeah. Wow. That's nice. Yeah, you got all the fun. Um, so, so, <laughs> so, yeah, I've never been there, but I regulate them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so it's recreational in Colorado, too, so everybody has to go. It's required. And uh, the deal is, is if you go buy alcohol, right, you show your ID, but they don't have to store the fact that you stored, that, that you checked the ID. It's just assumed. In dispensaries world, world they have to pr prove that they checked your ID. So what does that mean? That means you go there, they scan a picture of your ID that either lives on a server there or on the cloud. Identity theft opportunity right there. We don't know, you know, we don't regulate how they store those things. Um, so a much better solution is to store the fact that they actually checked the ID and it was true um, in a blockchain. And so those are the kinds of things that we're going to be leveraging. But more importantly is this idea that we can provide this fully digital on-ramp to any service anywhere so that you don't have to go through this um, really frustrating, archaic, manual identity process. Um, 
And so in Colorado, we're really, really excited about this. I'm really excited about this, as well as all the different blockchain use cases that we have, um, that we have going forward in the future. Uh, be sure to watch mycolorado.state.co.us if you're interested in finding more, or mycolorado on Twitter. I think you can, you can actually see it there. So that's all I've got right now. Um, we've got some time for questions, so we'd be more than happy to uh, field any of those right now. Russell, just a quick question oh, for you, sure. Russ. Is, uh, is, that on, is that technology currently, the My Colorado, is that on, the, on a blockchain, or is it still based on a centralized um, technology? Right, it's a great question. You know, the, the trust anchor that we use is the state DMV, okay. and clearly that's not a blockchain, right? That's a relational database. That's, that's, that's the next phase. The next phase is storing all that other stuff is going to be loaded in the blockchain. So we have a question over here. The uh, checking IDs with the digital identity, I mean, uh, is it tying into biometrics at all? Or, I mean... And so the, the objective is that this is going to be more secure than polycarbonate IDs, uh, right? Which is you have an ID that you may have just gotten or you may have gotten four years ago or seven years ago, depending on what state you are in, a picture that sort of looks like you hung over. Um, and, you know, you may be 10 or 15 pounds different and you may live in a different place, right? So we give real time and you can confirm um, either by receiving, right now it's just you hold up the, the ID. They have to use a thumbprint to unlock the screen basic things like that. Um, technology is coming with mobile phones in the next uh, cycle or two that will be able to give us a little more control over that. But, um, but right now, we're not looking to go to, you know, to full, you know, full like eye scans or anything like that. We're going to use the best technology we can for, um, for getting the widest use that's possible. You're limited to one device is tied to your identity. So you can't, you, you, uh, if you want to use it on a different phone, then it, it removes it from the other phone. So you can't have two people using the same one. Second question. Hello, uh, this is Kirsten Pamela's Langenbrunner. So I have a question for Ron. First of all, I wanted to thank you for all of your work to reform the bit license in New York um, and promote just more reasonable uh, blockchain regulation. So I wanted to know how you've been messaging uh, blockchain technology to your fellow legislators in such a reactionary legislature? <laughs> <laughs> well, the moment I mentioned the word blockchain, people's filters kind of go up naturally. And if I'm, I was at a community meeting and I mentioned the word cryptocurrency and, every, and someone literally got up and said, what is this Chinese guy doing <laughs> trying to manipulate the dollar? Somebody said that. I'm not even Chinese American, I'm, I'm a Korean American. So, <laughs> I, so this is, I mean, we live, we're living in an ecosystem where we get it, but out there, people are fear-driven. Um, any, any new change, whether it be the public or in places like Albany, it's very hard for people to wrap their head around. So I think it, we, that's why I try to lead with stories. Uh, that's why I try to really boil it down to ground-level situations where people can benefit immediately from these technologies, like uh, the senior citizen who can't get this benefit, like the domestic workers, like the gig workers, who we constantly expand tax credits for, but they could never get them, because how do you prove you have, how do you prove the six employee, employers to collect those tax credits at the end of the year? There's a, there's a system design failure, and we're not getting to the workers that we're trying to serve. And I think those are the type of narratives that people can wrap their head around. And blockchain is, happens to be in the back end um, technology. It, it don't have, you know, I don't even have to bring up the blockchain. You know, you could just lay out, uh, laid out a vision of what it could be in the future, a, a seamless peer-to-peer -peer, uh, decentralized world where no one's skimming off, the, off of our transactions and all the profits stay in local economies. All right, last question. Hi, Russell. Um, my name is Cindy Barney. I'm from the city of Dublin, Ohio, um, probably the smallest governmental agency here. <laughs> um, but we are working on a blockchain um, that um, revolves around resident identity. And my question would be your identity system um, I understand is not currently totally blockchain, but 
Is there an intention to allow those of us that absolutely love your state and intend to vacation there this summer <laughs> to include um, those of us outside your state in your identity program so that you could probably, you could possibly incorporate it into your, um, uh, your travelers that come there? Uh, thanks a lot. That's a really, I mean, that's a really exciting ask, right? Um, I think uh, we'd have to talk to a, a lot of different people and, and the likely answer is that uh, your state ID wouldn't, your state DMV wouldn't be particularly interested in having that be served up by Colorado, but um, I'm more than, more than happy to start the conversation and talk about it. And even, uh, you know, we, we did uh, secure the IP with patents, uh, provisional patents and copyrights and, tra and things like that. So uh, we are with the intention that we would be able to share them with other states once we prove them out. So uh, I would love to have that conversation with you afterwards. So thanks for, thanks for the question. Okay. I think that gives Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>